items now. And please, no flash photography during the event. Please do not applaud until the debate is completely finished. It will take about one hour. Today, our debaters will argue the following proposition. This House, as a democratic government, prefers that policies are set via referendum. Thank you. of the people, for the people, by the people. These are the foundations of democracy, and they, in essence, say that people have a voice, that people have a say, that people deserve to have their opinions heard. And there's no better way to identify the pulse of society, to understand the innate desires of the people in the world we live in today than through referendum. But before I begin with my arguments as to why referendums are the truly democratic process, I will first like to begin with some definitions. Firstly, a democratic government will be defined as a political system based on the principle that everyone in society is equal, with policies being a significant course of action proposed by an organization or person, in this case, the government. Now, to clarify, this, these policies won't be about trivial things like painting walls or what tie the president should wear. No, these will be about issues that individuals have a vested interest in. While referendums will refer to a direct vote by the people of a country on a single political issue. Pointer. Please sit down. Now, the yardstick of this debate would be which side better upholds the principles of democracy. Firstly, what exactly is our model and what do we want democratic governments to do? Well, in essence, what we want is that for any big decision that the people have a vested interest in should be decided via referendum because that is truly the most democratic way to decide something. Firstly, I as the first speaker will explain the principles while my second speaker will discuss the practical benefits while still upholding the principles of democracy. Now, how do referendums work and why are they truly the, in the principle of democracy? Firstly, every democracy is representative. Theoretically, this means that they elect individuals who are supposed to hear their voices and convey their opinions to the people on a holistic level and on a political party level, yes? No, because that is not true. That's a mischaracterization. Not every single policy has resounding effects on every single person. We're talking about the big policies that have a resounding effect on everyone or policies that are specifically for big issues, for example, economic issues, for one, and huge changes, for example, amendments to the law. Now, the problem in status quo is that po um, politics does not work this way. Democracies do not work this way because politics is multi-issue and how it stands today is that you vote for a single politician, your supposed representative. But instead of hearing all your voices, all your views, and all your opinions, what these politicians do instead is, or what happens instead, is that when you vote for a politician, because you agree with an issue important to you, you inherently support everything that they support. This is to say that whatever that politician wants to approve or wants to support, regardless of your own personal take on it, you, will, uh, you defer your say to them, which means they have your support because you voted for them. This is extremely problematic. It, cause it, it causes a homogenization in the opinions of every single voter into basically a choice between two specific candidates. Please sit down. This is extremely dangerous because of how society works with people voting based on only one or two issues that apply to them. Take, for example, a farmer. He'll vote on a politician most predominantly because of his policies relating to agriculture, relating to farming, relating to the things that affect his life. While a businessman, on the other hand, would vote on policies that pertain to business or the aspects that affect his life, while they won't put as much importance in all the other policies that politician supports. This results, these individuals, however, have a very, very high chance of not supporting every single policy that politician supports or believes in. Because it is impossible to find a politician that completely aligns with every single opinion, with every single policy you believe in. And this is why people's voices are being drowned out. They become a homogenous fray and just blindly defer their decision to the politician, as opposed to the spirit of democracy, where every person deserves their 
opinions to be heard, deserves to have their say, and deserves to influence the outcomes of their government, of their lives. Please sit down. In such scenarios, voices are expressed in single issues with that one person acting on behalf of you. You defer all choice to them. So this takes away your voice. It takes away your power and it takes away the power of the people. Through referendums, however, we are giving power back to you. We're giving power back to the people and we are truly upholding the democratic principles through side proposition. Supposedly in the definition of a democratic government, everyone it's based on the principle that everyone on society is equal. But let's take a step back and look at reality. How can everyone be equal if these politicians have so much greater say than the average person? Because the people defer their voices to these politicians, they are inevitably drowned out, and these politicians hold far more power than is, than is right. Plain and simple, this is atrocious. This is a wrong. This is against the very spirit of democracy because people are not equal in this regard, that the politicians have the power to basically make the decisions for everyone, regardless of the people's voice, regardless of what they're feeling, regardless of what they say. This is why we stand for referendums, because it will bring the power back to the people and allow them to voice their opinions, have decisions made in regards to what they want on every single issue, as opposed to blindly supporting and blindly delegating your voice because of you approve of how they handle one single thing. Now, why is this attained through a referendum? Well, plain and simple, it's attained through a referendum because every individual is equal. Please sit down. Every individual has a voice, a vote. Every individual has a say. This means that they, every single person, can influence the outcome of a policy, of a decision, of something that affects their lives. And this truly fulfills the idea of a representative democracy a lot better than status quo. Please sit down. Now, we'd like to also clarify that a referendum and is basically like a poll. It's an attempt to capture the pulse of the people, to understand the people. It doesn't necessarily translate the political action. What it means instead is it acts like a poll for politicians so that they can understand the people's wants. They can understand the innate desires of the people and what they want to do with their say. And as a result, it translates to them being able to act in accordance with the views of the people as opposed to having their voices drowned out. Because on every important issue, the people will have their say and the politicians will know their say and they will act in accordance lest they might not be voted in next term. So we can see that even the politicians would follow this because they have a vested interest to do so which translates the political this translates to political action in the future which is done for the benefit of the people upholding their voice representing them thus upholding the principle of democracy in a referendum the opinions of the people are not homogenized so they in a sense have a say on every single issue idea every single decision this is a lot better than in status quo and it's why we believe in referendums this also leads to the people being empowered because they are not drowned out because they have a tangible say and their voice and their opinion matters in deciding their fates the fates of their country the policies that are being decided this is what's truly democratic for a government to exist and conduct the mock a government exists to conduct democracy in an organized and structured manner. In no way should they take away an individual's voice, an individual's say. In a representative democracy, which sadly isn't happening in status quo, referendums are required. They're needed to give the voice back to the people. They're needed to change this to what it's supposed to be, to give the power back to the people whom it should have always been with. This is why I am very proud to propose. You wouldn't let a politician give you surgery. So why let a surgeon make complex policy decisions for your entire country? 
Ladies and gentlemen, the proposition today has ignored the complexity of most policies and does not understand the importance of having experts making decisions in this field. Which is why we, in principle, stand for a representative democracy. We think that the government should be the ones making decisions, not just on behalf of the people, but also based on what they know is best for the entire nation. So with that, we'd like to move on to a bit of housekeeping and rebuttals before I move on to my own substantives. We agree with the definitions provided by the proposition, but would like to expand upon the definition of a de democratic government. We don't think this is just a, a government that upholds the principle of equality, but also a government that gains its legitimacy through elections, fair elections with competition, where everyone has a fair chance of gaining a position in this government. We think any other government would not be considered democratic on our side of the house. Secondly, on the yardstick. They had said that the yardstick of today's debate would be whoever better upholds, no thank you, the principles of democracy. We would like to expand upon what these principles actually are. So we think that on our side, the principles of democracy that we would like to uphold are first of all the protection of people, and second of all, making better decisions for the nation as a whole. So we think that the yardstick of today's house is whichever side can accomplish these two things. But now, on a second point, no thank you, on the burden of today's debate. We think that the proposition's burden of today's debate is to accept that in most, if not all cases, things should be, policies should be set via referendum. And the opposition's burden would be to say if most, if not all, they should not be. But why is this the case? Now the proposition today tried to come up and tell you that they would only leave things to, um, things to referendum if they were big issues that were important to every single person in society. Now, this is extremely problematic because they then went on to tell you how they want to hear the voices of every single person in the nation. So why is this not upheld on their side? We see that if they are only looking at the issues that affect every single person, they're ignoring the voices of the women. They're ignoring the voices of minorities. They're ignoring all of the policies that affect a subgroup of people instead of the entire nation. So in all of these policies, they suddenly think that, oh no, if it affects a subgroup of people, this subgroup of people does not, uh, does not um, need the right to have a, a voice in all of these policies the way the entire nation does. So we don't really understand this contradiction in their case and push them to accept their burden on the whole. No, thank you, please sit down. So we ask them to accept their burden fully and really show how they uphold giving people the right to speak and the right to voice their opinions in all cases, not just the cases where it affects every single person in the nation. But with that, I'd like to move on to a few rebuttals. They talk today a lot about the principles of democracy and how they want every single person's voice to be heard. Now this sounds nice on the offset, and we do think that yes, if in an ideal situation, we would like every single person to be able to live exactly the way they choose. But in reality, this is never going to be the case. So we asked the proposition to actually come back to reality and argue us on what would happen in the real world. So let's see why this is not really as big of a problem as they are saying. First of all, we see that politicians generally uphold values that re represent a general basic value. We see that conservatives, for example, believe in equality based on outcome while democratic, or based on opportunity while democratic people tend to believe it based on outcome. We see that they have general principles based on freedom, based on equality, based on their definitions of democracy that define all other policies. It is these basic values from which they derive all other policies. So therefore, it is very likely that if a person agrees with one policy from a certain politician, they would, by extension, agree with a lot of other policies from this politician. But secondly, we think that they are being overly simplistic. We think that it is not just one politician who suddenly makes decisions for a whole country. Rather, they are ignoring, no thank you, all of the different factors that go into decision making within a government. We see that when a government make de makes decisions, it goes through debate from Congress, it goes through lobbying, interest groups. We see a lot of other ways for people to have their voice heard and to push for this. It is not just a single politician suddenly making decisions that are supposed to represent everyone. So here we see, again, a mischaracterization on their part. But lastly, even if we take them on their best case scenario, they're not actually fixing the issue because they're not giving everyone a voice, they're ignoring the minority, and we will be going into this within our substantives. But lastly, they said something at the end which we found extremely problematic. They said that these things will not necessarily translate to actions. They're just like a poll. So here we see that they themselves agree, they inherently agree that they don't want to leave the decision in the hands of the people. They are trying to put the safety measure to put the, the final decision in the hands of the politicians because they, like us, agree that the politicians need to be the experts. But we think this is extremely problematic because if they agree with us that the politicians need to be the ones making the final decisions, then why not just give them the decision in the first place? But before I continue, Yes, sir. Then do you support a state that's run by technocrats? No, we support a state that has a democratic government. If the people had elected that government, and if everyone in the, if people had elected the government in a fair and legitimate, legitimate way, then yes, sure, but we don't think this would necessarily be the case. 
Now, with that, we move on to our case for today. Our first objective on, is on why politicians are the best agent. Our second is on the tyranny of the majority. And the third, which my second speaker will be taking, will be on the opportunity course in terms of time and resources. So on our first substantive on why politicians are the best agent, the thesis of this point is that the government has the principle and practical duty to make the decisions for the people. Now on a principle level, the role of the government is to be making the decisions for the good of the whole nation. This is something that is established by the social contract as they have an overarching view and can see what is best for the whole nation. But on a practical level, we can see that the government is best equipped to make decisions for three main reasons. First of all, politicians are experts. Most of these politicians are college educated. They have studied politics and economics or whatever field that they specify in for many years. So therefore, they have a much better understanding of the potential long and short term implications of whatever policy they are carrying through. They are experienced, they understand the way the nation works, and they can look beyond their own personal vested interests. Secondly, because of the mechanism by which decisions are made. In the government, these decisions are made through debate. These politicians in the House of, Cong in the House of Representatives and in the Senate debate for a long time and hear every other perspective before making a final decision, unlike on their side where people just vote. And so on our side, after ha having this debate, politicians have a much better understanding of issues. Thirdly, they are held accountable. These decisions affect everyone, so they are held accountable by the international community, by people, by organizations, and they can't just run away from a decision once it is made. And this gives them an incentive to make the best decision possible. So on their side, why are people not capable of making the same decisions? First of all, they are not as well informed. Since there are so many decisions on their side, so many referendums that might affect the entire country, practically it will not be possible for people to fully understand the issues. They're already running their own nine to five jobs. They're not gonna have a full thorough understanding of these issues. So either they'll be apathetic and not go out and vote at all, which means that they won't actually get the representation and the voices that they want to hear. Or secondly, they'll have everyone's votes, but people will be misinformed when they're voting, which is even worse because they'll have bad decisions on their side. Furthermore, on a second point, they are not thought through, they vote on impulse, and on a third point, they are not held accountable. After the vote, they can forget about it and they can pretend it never happened. Our second point is on the tyranny of the majority, and the thesis of this point is that leaving policies up to referenda negatively affects the minorities of a nation. So the prop might come up and say as they have the views of the people, but who are the people in reality? On their side, even if 51% of the population believes something, that thing happens, even if it's not necessarily the best. So who is hurt in this process? The racial minorities, the gender minorities, the ethnic minorities are hurt because their votes are the ones that are drowned out. Their votes are the ones that are overshadowed by the minorities. And essentially, it's equal to them having no vote because their say is never heard. So a government is better because on our side, minorities can rally to the government. They can protest. They can gain media or international support. They can pressure government in other ways other than just having the majority of numbers, something that they will never be able to gain. And we see through examples throughout history that the government does care about minority groups when they are pressured through the Civil Rights Act and even more recently, all the LGBTQ rights and gay marriage movements that have been passing. So we see that on our side, we protect people. On our side, we make better decisions, which is why we are proud to propose. Thank you. What we heard from side opposition is a lot of mischaracterization from side proposition and that they're accusing us of a lot of things that don't, we don't necessarily support. They say that we're ignoring minorities, but no, we're not ignoring minorities. In our definition, we said that referendums will be given to all issues that have a vested interest for general society. The only exception we said was for trivial issues. They push this burden of absolutism where they said that proposition has to defend this referendum action being taking place in every single issue that happens in society. We don't think that is a fair burden to push for proposition, and rather the burden that we will defend that is more appropriate to this debate is the idea that referendums and political issues 
issues that have a vested interest for the whole, whole society as a whole is what we will have referendums. It is not necessarily that we'll ignore referendums and not have referendums for issues affecting minorities. Because even if it is a referendum for gay marriage or against it, this still has a reverberating effect for the rest of society and thus we will have a referendum for it and thus that is something that opposition has to recognize. So another rebuttal that I'll give to you is they said that saying doesn't have to transfer to political action and how this is a concession that people don't necessarily know. No, we didn't say this. We said that this is truly what is representative democracy. When a referendum happens, it doesn't necessarily guarantee political action because the representatives are simply looking at what the people want and deciding then um, acting on what the people desire and what their innate wants are. But we're saying that in most scenarios, they do innately follow with what the people want, but we're not saying it's absolute guarantee. And we don't see why it's a concession or any problem from side proposition on there. Then they say politicians have to be educated, but we don't really see why this is necessarily true. You don't need to be educated to have an opinion. We said in our definition that democracy is treating everyone like equals. And it's not equality, and it's completely unfair, and it's rude from side opposition to say that someone who is more educated has a more valuable opinion and has a more right to say something and do something for your country and your government just because they were able to afford to go to a Harvard education and afford to study politics. We think that if it were truly democratic and everyone is truly equal, a farmer has the same right as a surgeon and has the same right as a politician to influence the actions of a government. In our POI, we asked, do they support technocracies and said, no, we don't support technocracies. And thus, they're conceding that they don't want absolute experts in power. They don't want absolute economists making the decisions and they don't want absolute farmers making decisions about farming and etc. They don't want people who are absolute experts in fields to make the final calls. This is a concession from their side because they're saying you don't need absolute knowledge in a decision to make a call. Because politicians are not absolute experts about everything. Politicians don't know what it takes to farm grass. Politicians don't know what is best for gay people. They're not te technocrats. And thus, if they're opposing technocrats, they're conceding that you don't have to be experts to make a call and have an opinion, which is in line with what we're saying on side proposition. Even a farmer has a right to act and a right to express his opinion, because that is what democracy is about. It is not what is best for the people, but is what people want to express themselves and what people can get their voices across, regardless if it is good or bad for for the rest of society, if a farmer believes a decision is good for him, then it is perfectly legitimate for him to express that through a referendum. Then they said, this other addi addition to this debate and this idea of democracy is a protection of people. First of all, that doesn't really make sense because protection of people is simply a burden of governments in general, not simply a democracy. And we still think the democracy ideal that we have to defend on both sides is a representation of people. Lastly, they said politicians generally have principles that define other poli po uh, policies, and thus it's very likely for someone to, who supports a politician to support all the policies. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a huge assumption coming from side opposition. It is very fallacious for them to argue that just because I support Donald Trump means that I support every single policy of Donald Trump. Just because I support Francois Hollande means I support every single policy of Francois Hollande. That is completely unfair from side opposition and they don't have any logical link why you supporting one idea translates to you supporting every idea. We give analysis why this is not true from my first speaker which don't really engage with. The fact that a farmer votes on a politician based on what is best for his farming interests. He doesn't have to agree with everything else in terms of economics, in terms of health, and in terms of all the other bills and all the other possibilities. Now, let me move on to my constructives, the one being the positive benefits of referendums such as that they act on isolated policies. But before that, sure. Because you have a referendum, they have the right to express their people, a uh, right to express their opinion. And we don't have to necessarily have the minorities get what they want. Because in status quo, in democracy, even in elections, minorities don't get what they want because it's not the representation of the majority of the society, of the holistic society. Democracy is about doing what the majority and the vast uh, population of people want, not simply attending to the needs of every single person. So we are fine in some scenarios in which minorities may not get what they want, but we think they at least should get their voices heard, and that's what they do referendums. So now to my constructives and the positive benefits. The problem in status quo is that what a lot of people get a voice is on regards with issues that have a great potential for bias, issues that are inherently subjective. This is in status quo is issues such as electing a politician, which involves a cost benefit analysis, weighing off of two evils and subjective decisions. Referendums are different in the fact that they discuss absolute decisions. It's either staying in the EU or leaving in the EU. It's a less, it's, there's no lesser of two alternatives because there's no middle ground absolutely. 
This is very good because it provides certainty for individuals regarding their lives. If you vote for a politician, you don't know if one policy is better for you and one policy will be more harmful for you. But when you vote in a referendum, you can tangibly decide whether that policy is good for you and you vote for it or if that policy is harmful you and you don't vote for it. And this is extremely helpful for individuals when they want to know thank you, make economic decisions, when they want to make investments, when they want to plan out their farming schedules. At least they have a level of certainty that they don't get on normal status quo democracies in supposedly rep represented democracies because people and the politicians are doing their own will, not representative. The people are not really taking care of the issues what the people want. The next level of analysis and the benefit, no thank you, is how this pushes for a more educated populace. In status quo, in representative democracies, people have an idea that they have no say because authorities are making the decisions, the big people in the government and the Congress are making the calls, and the little people on the ground don't really have much of a say. When they get a referendum, they're going to feel empowered and they're going to take this into their own hands and be um, incentivized to research, incentivized to learn about the more issues and leads to a more uh, a society that is aware of the surroundings. We'll give you an example for this. For example, when South America voted for the idea of FARC, the free trade agreement, they, following this referendum being posed, there was great discourse developing, great uh, increase in knowledge of this people, and this was extremely beneficial as people became more knowledgeable, no thank you, about the economic ideas and economic benefits. And this is good, and this is a value that we want on society. We want everyone to be equal in knowledge as well, and we want everyone to be incentivized to get that education because they feel like they have a say. This is principally beneficial to the definition my partner showed you of how it is more equal and thus it creates more discourse. Lastly, the last benefit is the idea that it provides a check and balance for politicians in power. Why is this necessary? Politicians worldwide are not very compassionate and all righteous people. Let's be real. They sometimes act in their own self-interest and they sometimes are corrupt. Perfect example of this is Donald Trump, who's constantly pushing for policies that favor his own companies as opposed to policies that necessarily favor America. Now, if we don't have referendums, Donald po uh, Trump's policies have a chance of passing. And this is problematic because it's self-interest to just simply Donald Trump. But with a referendum, the people can act as a counterbalance, countervailing force, and check and balance to make sure that what is best for the people happens as opposed to what is best for Donald Trump. As a whole, because we want to fight for the people, because we want to get their voices heard, and because we care about the citizens on the ground, not simply people who are educated and employed in the highest position of authority, we are proud to propose. Thank you. Foundations of democracy mean to represent all people. This is what we heard from side proposition today. Yet we also heard that when a farmer's vote, vote does not translate into action, that is okay. We heard that when a minority's opinion simply gets swept under the tyranny of the majority, that is okay. We don't think that proposition stands truly for the representation of all people. We think that the proposition stands for an oversimplified version of this, and that is why we are proud to oppose today. So in terms of the points of contention for today, first of all, a clarification regarding who better represents people and the principle of this idea, and also in terms of the benefits of referenda. 
So first of all, on term, in terms of principle, now the proposition today has given us a principle contradiction that my first speaker already pointed to, yet they did not actually deal with to the fullest extent. We see that the government on their side gets to overrule any decisions that are made through a referenda by the people. But we see this is actually a concession because they think that politicians, on their second speaker, a large portion of the speech is about how politicians don't have the interests of all people in mind, how they don't necessarily represent all the people. However, by saying that this government actually does get the right to overrule decisions made by the people, they are placing trust in the hands of the same government that they criticize for taking action on our side. We see that if they can see that politicians should get the right to overrule, these very pol same politicians are the same actors on our side of the house, and therefore their criticism no longer stands. Now, because of this concession, the politicians clearly aren't at all as bad as Prop tries to tell you. So we see that this is actually even worse on their side because they, on, on their side, politicians who are actually making positive decisions and are actually um, help, trying to help the interests of all the people are actually now going to be held accountable to misinformed decisions and to decisions made by apathetic voters. Two of the key points made by my first speaker and her substantives that were not tackled. We see that when we have excessive numbers of referendums on, every, on pretty much all policies, um, we see that this actually creates a lot of voter apathy because not as much attention is drawn to the most important issues and therefore this actually creates a less informed public because this public is actually not necessarily tied to wanting to learn about every particular issue, but we also see that the decisions made by this public is misinformed. Why is this the case? Because we see psychological effects, like the fact that people do not necessarily think through the long-term impacts of what they are deciding on, especially if it is not their job to do so. We see that politicians have the job to consider nuance, to consider long-term implications, whereas a farmer might only consider the fact that in the present moment he is facing an agricultural downturn in, this, uh, in the success of his agricultural uh, productivity. The politician's role is to consider the fact that in the long term this farmer has to have a different sort of system to actually help that farmer in the, in the first place. So we see that this kind of long term implication is not necessarily considered by people and because of this politicians are now held to, accountable to decisions that are indeed misinformed and this is actually um, creating something that is even worse on their side of the house. Now in terms of the benefits of referenda however, they think that they want to protect the voices of, of little people. They get angry at us for not taking into account the farmer's view for policies, and yet their second speaker actually told us that it doesn't matter if this voice translate in, translates into action. Now, we see on our side of the house, yes, we do think that these individual people are not actually, um, are, are, are voting um, not necessarily in each specific policy, but they are voting for individuals who best represent them. Now we told you already that certain parties are based on fundamental values, no thank you. And we see that because these parties are based on these fundamental values, it is indeed likely that these, that these parties do represent different voices of the people. However, we also told you that we actually, um, that we actually have a government that follows through on trying to protect the voices of these people. Why is that the case? Because politicians on our side actually have the incentive to pr protect the voices of minorities, whereas on their side they don't have an actor that actually takes this into consideration. Consideration. Because politicians have things like term limits, where, where they actually want to leave, no thank you, a legacy that actually is held, where they're held accountable to all the people in four-year, two-year terms, where they are trying to please people in order to get reelected. We see that this actually provides an incentive for politicians to actually be held accountable to all of these different types of people, whereas on their side, they have no incentive for the tyranny of the majority to consider suddenly some minority viewpoint. And we see that on their side, if they do want to stand for the true principle that they are supposed to, the burden of actually having to take into account the entire public's opinion, then they would indeed stand for a referendum in which all people simply vote and this automatically gets put into practice. No thank you. However, because they see that they themselves want the government to put a check on this, this is a principal contradiction and it is actually negative um, practically. We also see, however, the fact that um, we also see, however, that the fact that politicians in our world do actually consider the incentives of, do actually consider all of these people's um, views in, in, in their terms as well. Before, before moving on to my substantive, yes, sir. Why do you think policy referendums get voter apathy? It's not like you're having a referendum 15 times a second. It's only a couple of times a year, so it's not gonna take attention away from the issues. It's not gonna make people tired. Thank you for bringing that up. Actually, this leads into a good, uh, an important question for today's house. When will referenda actually be in place? 
Now we see that as a side proposition, they have given us an extremely vague definition of when referenda are actually going to be put in place. We ask them, are they going to do this, um, are they going to do this um, every, for every single policy? And they say, no, we're only going to do it when people's vested interests are involved. Well, what does this motion actually say? This motion says we're actually, we're doing, we're having referendas in place as, because we prefer them in a majority of cases, which means the proposition's burden is actually to show that that referenda should be preferred in a majority of cases. And if they are preferred in this majority of cases, they do have the burden to show why even in somewhat trivial issues, not only in the large scale issues of things like Brexit, they do actually have the burden to show that even in these small cases, they would rather have referenda. Now with this in mind, we see that this actually um, with this in mind, we see that because of this, voter apathy is likely to be increased because of the frequency of these referenda that is likely to happen simply by definition of the motion. Now, with this in mind, I would like to go into our third substantive for today's House, on opportunity cost. So the thesis of this is that having referendums to set policies has burdensome opportunity costs that outweigh the benefits that proposition provides. The problem on proposition's side is that they have a referenda for the this, this, this scope of policies, and the fact is that they have a greater frequency of, of referenda, at least more so than in the status quo. So we see that because of this, um, as my first speaker has already shown you, this is likely to cause things like voter apathy or misinformed decisions. But apart from that, it also has certain direct costs like time, money to organize polls and all of these different things. But perhaps the most important opportunity cost we see here is political inefficiency. And why is this the case? Because we are acting and operating in democratic nations in which politicians have to actually campaign in order to actually get um, certain different policies pushed for. We see that these politicians are acting on things like two-year and four-year terms. And generally, what politicians would spend this time doing is creating different policies and acting change, uh, interacting, negotiating trade deals, doing all of these other valuable things for the benefit and progress of their country. However, with all of these frequent referenda, we see that this time is instead spent on trying to explain to their populace what to vote for while not actually enacting this change. We see the impacts of this is that they, on proposition, they have the goals of de decreasing bureaucracy and increasing political efficiency, but they actually decrease political efficiency because the government now has to wait on a referendum each and every time they have to do, uh, have to enact a policy, and in this time they're likely to have to campaign for their own side and they can't really do much else. Weighed against their benefits in the short term of actually fulfilling some people's whims and fancies, in the long term, politicians are not able to make these decisions for the benefit of people, and the politicians, the very politicians that they want these decisions to lie in the hands of, will not actually be able to enact the change that they want to happen. We believe that the people are not able to look necessarily into the long term as politicians would be, and because of this fact, and because of the fact that they are not only limiting people, they are also limiting politicians, we are proud to oppose. In this debate, opposition has accused us of contradicting ourselves multiple times, but they've really completely mischaracterized and misunderstood our model. So before I go on to explain why we take this debate on multiple clash points, I'm gonna clarify a few of the key contentions and misunderstandings of the basic model itself. One of the key problems that they had with our case is this difference between voices being heard and actual political action being taken. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's already an inherent value for your voices to be heard as it's a benefit for our democracy. Our first speaker told you why just because by already having your voices heard, you're moving already more towards a democratic system. We understand that not everyone's voices are gonna translate into action because if it's not the rule of the majority and if it's not what most people want, that's not what's gonna happen in a democracy. We don't have to defend the idea that every single thing every single minority wants must happen. The very fact that they can be represented in itself and the very fact that they can have their voices heard is already an inherent benefit to democracy. The second, the second idea, the strange thing coming up, is this deaf challenge coming from the second speaker when they question us on what exactly we mean by a policy. We've already told you in our first speaker that we define this as policies that have significant courses of action. They keep questioning us on what big case is gonna happen or whether it's a small case without actually telling us what is a small case to you, what is a big case to you. We tell you that realistically, please sit down. In many countries, even if you vote for, a no even if you have a majority of policies being ratified by a referendum, this still does not occur on the scale that they say to create enough voter apathy. So we don't think that's gonna happen. Thir thirdly, this idea they say that politicians can overturn majorities so, uh, so it doesn't really protect democracy on our side. Well, we told you that just because it's possible doesn't mean it's gonna happen. They never explain why it's likely that politicians are gonna overturn things, especially when their entire case has been hinged on the idea that politicians are true representatives of democracy. So we see that insofar as politicians are representative of the democracy and representative of the constituents of the state they control, we think that if, if the people vote on a thing and express their views, they're more likely than not to proceed with it. That's why Brexit, even though it faced Supreme Court challenges and legal challenges, it still, was, it still wasn't countered in government because they recognized the principle of democracy being established there, and they recognized the increased stigma that it occurs if they do this. Now, since we've, since we've gone past those few mischaracterizations, back to the main case. Please sit down. Firstly, one key clash point that occurred was whether or not whether or not people generally agree on policies. Now, coming from them, they say that politics, politicians generally uphold general principles, broad basic values, and it's based on fundamental values, which is why people are likely to agree with multiple things. Well, there's a huge assumption here in that just because I agree with one idea coming from one side, that I'll automatically agree with everything coming from their side. Their only principle justification here is that there's a broad overarching ideology behind it, which is why they're likely to follow everything in the situation. But just because something falls under one broad one broad ideology does not mean that you necessarily agree with another thing that focuses on this broad uh, ideology. The, the very definition in the saying this, it's a very broad. That means you don't necessarily have to agree with every single facet of it. In fact, we think we saw this demonstrated recently where despite Donald Trump running on the Republican candidate seat, many Republicans actually opposed him or did not vote for him because people, even if under a general level or under a or preset ideology, they have different nuances. I can support gay rights and I can support things, but I, I can also be in favor of low taxes, something that are on opposite ends of the Democratic and Republican spectrum. We didn't see any analysis about why it's necessarily true that everyone who votes for a Republican follows every single policy that a Republican generally has. Secondly, another, secondly, the idea about there's already existing systems in place was a major clash point. Now, their first speaker talked about ideas of lobbies and debate. Now, we think that a lot of people are unable to access these systems. When they talk about systems such as debates happening in Congress and Parliament, when they talk about lobbies, they're actually disregarding the biggest stakeholder in the situation, which is the majority of the population. Because who really gets represented in these lobbies? We think these are things like big multinational corporations or big politicians, which may not necessarily fully represent the full range of ideas. Ideologies. Now, we, misunder we must understand that even if we add referendums to this process, we're not taking away this debate, we're not taking away these lobbies. We understand that they're integral parts of the political system, but we think that referendums are an important addition because they actually allow the voice of the people to manifest, and they actually give the ability for the people's voice to be heard, rather than being drowned out in the system. But equally, we think it's very strange that they want to come up here and talk about ethnic minorities, I'll take you in a second, when in the very systems they talk about in debating and lobbies, that's where they're least represented at all. Once again, a complete mischaracterization of our model. We said, one, there's gonna be a vested, in one case, there's gonna be a vested interest for majority of people, but secondly, it's a huge issue that affects the ramifications of society. Key word, huge issue. We think things like gay rights, minority rights, are huge issues because they also contain certain ideological battles happening between large remnants of the population. Just because it's not tangible and just because it's ideological doesn't, doesn't mean that it's not affecting a large part of the community. That's something they fail to understand. Now, 
Once again, when they talk about ethnic minorities but want to limit this debate to places like Congress and lobbies where they have even less representation as compared to big multinationals, we think that's very principally disingenuous to what they want. Now, this final, this final clash point that comes, please sit down, about why government has the principle and practical level to make the decisions as opposed to the people. Now, they give you three ideas here, that they're experts, that there's lots of debate, and there's accountability. Firstly, on the idea that we're experts. Now, coming time and time again from our side, we've shown you why just because you have increased knowledge on something doesn't make your beliefs any more legitimate than people who are perhaps less knowledgeable than you. We think that just because you may be more educated, just because you have a better understanding of certain ideas, does not make you fit to decide what's best for every single person in the community. We think that those individuals, please sit down, have the choice to take that into their hand, hands, have the choice to make sure what's best for them. But when they talk about ac accountability, we've told you on our side why we have even more accountability when we engage in this discourse, coming from my second speaker that was wholly unresponded to on their side. Because when you have these referendums, you're involving more people, and there's increased engagement with the thing. And so what happens at the end of this referendum is that when you reach a result, there's more public attention towards this policy than it is simply decided in places like Congress or Parliament, where there's more attention by multinationals, more attention by politicians than the international community, than local people. Because when you get the local populace involved, it creates further incentive to become more involved and watch the progress. What happened with Brexit, please sit down, is there's constant monitoring by the people who've lost, because they become a vested interest into it by involving them. There's constant monitoring going on to see how Brexit's decision is progressing, to see how it's going on. So we think we have more accountability on our side, where people are more closely monitoring what happens with the, the referendum choice. Another thing they talk about a why government has a better idea is because people are misinformed and there's more voter apathy. Well, to tackle this idea of voter apathy, we think that there's, we think once again, there's a mischaracterization and a huge romanticization of how many of these referendums are having. We tell you realistically, it's not like we're gonna have one a week or maybe t uh, one, 10, a, 10 a week. We think it's much more likely to have these policies occurring maybe once a month or three times a year, as happens in many countries like Switzerland, where this system is already a model. This doesn't happen multiple times a week. But furthermore, we tell you there's more incentive to be informed because there's a lack of possibility to appeal to populist and emotional rhetoric that can happen in general elections because you dilute the, con dilute the things you talk about. When you concentrate the issue into one specific issue, you're more likely to provide information to people than if they have to engage with multiple issues, which is what general elections do. And furthermore, we think ethnic minorities are much worse on their side because there's even less representation. If you take the worst case scenario when they're not represented at all, it doesn't change with general elections versus this. And finally, this idea about time and money. Well, we think just because it's hard to become more democratic doesn't excuse you from trying. We think democracy is a principle but the, both sides want to uphold, and the effectiveness is not really an argument here. Very proud to propose. Two main questions for the House today. First off, who upholds the principles of democracy? This was the yardstick they gave us today, and I will show you how we win on the precedent and yardstick they set us. But second question, which government protects the people? The yardstick we set out to you today, something they didn't actually seek to prove. So first question, who upholds the principles of democracy? So on this idea of mechanism, we told you down the bench that they had a principal contradiction when they said they would have a referendum and then let po politicians decide what actually they'll do. But then their third speaker came up and said that, oh, but you actually need to give us a reason why politicians will actually overrule the referendum. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason was given to you in their second speaker's second substantive. He clearly said, and I quote, politicians are greedy, and I quote, 
politicians are self-interested. If so, if these are the people they're saying are so bad, then how else and how can they give the power to overrule these referendums and their world? We see that practically it doesn't work. But principally, the fact that they would allow politicians to overrule the decisions that people came up themselves, and then they came up and say that they are representing all people is a principal contradiction on their side, where on one hand they say, we allow everyone's voices, no thank you, to be heard. But then on the other side, they say that actually we're going to allow politicians to make the decisions. The principle and subtext of their argument when they say politicians can overrule is that they're saying politicians are smarter than everyone else. That is the subtext, and that is the reason they're actually allowing politicians to overrule these uh, referendums. And that is a contradiction on their side, where on one side they're saying politicians are smarter than everyone else, but on the other side they're saying that politicians don't actually have the right and everyone has this equal voice. So this tension in their case is something that they have been unable to resolve down the bench, which shows that with that unprincipally consistent opposition, they automatically lose. But then let's look at their first case today, and this is the first substantive on people not being heard. So we came up and told you that politicians have generally agreed upon principles, and as a result, when you vote for them in the general election, it is likely that you will be represented. Now, they came up and said that, oh, no, but you're not going to be listening. Uh, you're not, a politician is not going to represent you in every single way. And here, we agree. And if we take them on their best case scenario, we like to say that there are other ways to be heard if you don't agree with a politician in every single facet. We see that you can have petitions, you can have rallies, you can have the media support what you're saying, in which you can coerce your politician to actually listen to your own ideologies. So here we see we're not just helping only um, a small group of people, but we're helping the majority if you don't agree with your politician. But furthermore, we like to say they never take it us on our best case scenario, in which we told you that in a general election, you vote for someone that's, if we talk about the US, Democratic or Republican. And so it is likely that most of the policies you're talking about are agreed upon. We're telling you, first off, no thank you, sir. We are helping the people be represented in most general policies, but second off, even if on their best case scenario, if you're not represented by your government, then you have other alternative means, something we heard no response to in their own case. But then they came up and said that in a democracy, everyone has equal opinions, and as their second speaker said, a Harvard education doesn't actually matter. So if we take their principle to the extreme, ladies and gentlemen, everyone in this audience, you guys would be going to farmers to get your root canal done. That sounds scary. That's not something I want, a, w a world that I want to live in. We see that experts do have their place, and if someone is an expert comparatively, an individual person on the ground versus a politician that does have this ex education, they're better equipped to actually deal with this. But in a second, sir, second off, we see that we're not ignoring the voices of people on the ground because we do have general elections, and in those people do have the right on a big picture to vote for the politician that they are would support. So in a second, sir, don't let them fool you into thinking that we're not letting people's voices heard. But before I move on, yes, sir. When you get a root canal, it affects you. But when you make national policy, it affects every citizen in that country. Isn't there a big difference there? Exactly. So if this is a policy that is affecting every single one, why would you let someone that's unqualified make the decision? Thank you for proving my case. And now... Moving on, we see that they tried to say that we conceded when we talked about technocrats. And we, when we said that, no, we would not have technocrats come into power. First off, we say that's not a concession because we say that if a technocrat was voted into power, that's okay. But second off, if we take them on their best case scenario, we say we don't need technocrats in Congress or in the government. Why so? Because the Congress does have a board of experts that they can actually go and talk to. So as a result, we don't need politicians on their side to be technocrats. So this concession that they're talking but doesn't actually stand. We're talking, no thank you sir, simply on the ability that politicians generally should be more elected, more knowledgeable, and we look comparatively, on our side we have politicians that are more knowledgeable, but on their side they're giving this right on specific complex policies, ladies and gentlemen, just not ordinary things, on complex policies like the TPP. They're leaving this in the hands of individual people that don't necessarily have the time or the knowledge on this issue. But second question today, which government actually protects the people on the ground? This was our yardstick, something they never actually engaged with us. So when we talk about minorities today, we have to look at who actually protects the minorities. So they came up and said that even in a representative democracy, the minority is not actually heard. But now we see that there are two responses from us here. First off, we see that comparatively, the minorities are heard more on our side. 
why on their world, when you have referendum, that means 49% of the people are not actually heard. But on our world, it doesn't matter who you actually elect into power, that person is still gonna be thinking about the minorities. Why? Two reasons. First off, we have the Congress and the House or other means of checks and balances. And this means that different minorities are in the parliament and they are looking out for the minority groups, something they don't actually have when they just simply have referendum. But second off, we told you in our second speaker something we had no response to, that politicians actually have an incentive to help out the minorities because they want to get reelected. Two responses we heard no, no um, response to in a second, sir. But third off, we see that countries would like to help the minorities when they're in power because they have an international reputation to protect, which is why they're on our side. For these three main reasons, we actually help the minorities. But before I move on, yes, sir. Even with referendums, your idea about minorities representing in Congress still can still exist. Why is that mutually exclusive to your side? We see it's mutually exclusive because in referendums, you're enacting policies that will then be put into power, into place. And as a result, this will directly affect the minorities because an individual on the ground is only thinking about themselves and not other people. But the Congress and the government will be thinking about the general people because they have their incentives to do so. But second off, they came up and said that in their world, in their mechanism, they're only going to be having um, referendum on big issues. And the only example they gave us was on LGBTQ issues. But on their best case, we see that that means that policies on infrastructure of a minority group won't actually be voted upon. This is exactly how they don't protect the minorities and their best in their world. Because if something doesn't affect everyone, let's look at the infrastructure of a minority group, that means that it won't actually be taken into account. But then we came up in this idea on voter apathy. They said that why would there be, vo be voter apathy? You're only going to be voting a few times a year. Ladies and gentlemen, the status quo, you have elections once every four years if you're talking about the United States, and there's already voter apathy. In their world where they have one or two elections every year, we see voter apathy, apathy is much, much worse. Their third speaker came up and said how they're diluting interest. That is exactly what they're doing in their world because people don't necessarily care about each individual issue anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, as side opposition. We help the minorities, but we ensure that the people that are best qualified to be making these decisions are making them. That is why we are proud to oppose. Thank you. It becomes problematic when our opponents today have refused to engage with half of our substantive case. We told you that politicians are experts in their field. They simply asserted that education is not important. Well, we showed you that education experience means you understand broader, long-term implications beyond opinions. 
no response from their side. We told you how politicians debate with each other instead of taking impulsive decisions that are one-sided and based on information that could be fed to them by sensationalized media sources. No response from side proposition. We told you that on their side, nobody is held accountable and nobody can be blamed for the decisions that are made. No response. We told you about how politicians are, wa are wasting time trying to simply pander to public opinion rather than making solid decisions about negotiations, trade deals, and true progress in society. We assume that because they've dropped these points that they concede with these factors. And most importantly though, we told you about the tyranny of the majority. And all of their, their responses to this were simply in saying that it doesn't matter if the actions that are taken do not represent the true do not represent the public as a whole as long as public opinion is simply voted on, not acted on. Essentially, the proposition today has created a facade that they care about everybody, when in reality, they tell everybody that their voices are heard, but we don't really see any real change. They want a band-aid cover-up, whereas we, on side opposition, actually take action. We care about minorities, and we act on it. So in terms of the two worlds for today's house, two main points of contention. First of all, on the principles of democracy, and second of all, in terms of the practical manifestation of these principles, in terms of both the proposition's world and the opposition's world today. In terms of the principles of democracy, which is something that both sides truly wanted to fulfill as a goal in today's house, we see that side proposition's world is a world that cannot truly stand for both representative democracy and referenda simultaneously because of the fact that rep referenda simply means allowing the people to express their opinions and act on these opinions directly without the hindrance of a government to stand in between of this. And we see that they're not actually taking into account the fact that referenda have a tyranny of majority in which not all people's opinions can truly be voiced. They only want referenda in extremely few cases because they, we see that on their side they have this condition that referenda only are taking place in terms of huge issues or issues that consider everyone's vested interest, which is somewhat of a principal contradiction, especially given the fact that they believe referenda are so good. If they are so good, then why not allow people to vote directly on issues that on other policies that the government takes into consideration? And if the government is so bad, then why allow the government to take to take action on issues that on other issues other than the ones that they simply define as ex extremely important on their side. We also told you, however, that this definition is extremely vague because why would an issue that concerns a minority group actually be considered as a hugely important issue to a nation as a whole? We heard no response to this, something that is extremely important, especially if they choose to consider the fact that they want to represent all people. On opposition's world, however, we have people voting in their best fit. We have, even if this best fit is not perfect, we have checks and balances in the government that protect the views of all people. And even better, the government will, if, if people are super unhappy with the government, they can simply re-elect a different leader in the next term. However, policies by referenda are fixed and policies by referenda are determined only by the majority. Now, in terms of the practical manifestation of these referenda, we see that on side proposition, politicians simply waste time because they they have to be held accountable to opinions that are largely misinformed and apathetic. And we see that this is something that creates an even more ineffective system politically, something that they did not respond to. We see that there is what is called voter apathy because at least compared to status quo, they're having a greater frequency of referenda, something that their only response to was a wishy-washy definition of when and when not they would have referenda. However, even worse, they would have a misinformed public. Ladies and gentlemen, after Brexit, one of the most Google search terms was the fact was about what Brexit actually is. We see this is the sort of world that side proposition actually chooses to live in, a world in which the government, in which the people do not actually know what they are voting on. On side opposition, the government can work and make actual changes that will benefit everyone based on expert advice and based on interest group desires. Politicians focus on what is important in the long term and have people at least represented to the best of their ability. And this is why we are proud to oppose.
the one thing that I learned in this debate about side opposition is that they know how to use a lot of big words because all they come up here and say is principally inconsistent, contradiction, unresponsive. Even though time and time again, down my bench, we came here and told you why we're not principally inconsistent, why we're not unresponsive. And I will outline on these key areas how we were actually defending and not on the, any allegations that they gave you. So they were two reasons why they simply can't win this debate. The one being that they're arguing in an unrealistic world in some vacuum that we don't really live in, and secondly, because a lot of their rebuttals and arguments are based on mischaracterization. The most prominent examples of their unrealistic world is the fact that they say these assumptions, such as if you support a political party, you're gonna support every single idea and every single policy of that per person. We proved to you why this is an assumption, and they didn't really defend it, and they're simply unresponsive to any rebuttal we said on that. Then this whole idea about the possibility of overruling, guaranteeing that the overruling will occur. Once once again, this is a huge assumption. We gave you an example from my third speaker how the stigma exists. Even though you can legally overturn it, you won't necessarily do so because you have people who will give you backlash and who will not cut slack for you, and thus these people won't necessarily interest, uh, enter those ideas. The problem with opposition in this debate is the fact that they argue a lot about the harms of referendum, but they don't understand that those harms exist in status quo, and they don't show you why the status quo of current democracy as it is, is actually more better for democracy and more representative of people. And this is where we clearly see in these two issues. The first one being about apathy versus education, and the second one being about representation as a whole. All opposition comes up here and tells you is that apathy will occur, and their only example and logic for that is, oh, when we're voting for politicians, we have apathy, thus it'll be the same for referendum. The key caveat that we said is that we have apathy for politicians because they don't like the politicians. I said in my speech, something they don't ignore, they ignored, is the fact that in referendums you either like it or you dislike it. It's absolute. They're simply not liking a referendum. You have to support it, you have to against it, and you can't have a middle ground. Thus, you're going to vote for it. The reason there's apathy in politicians, you can simply not vote and simply not express your opinion. In the reply, we hear this new material and this idea of Google search and how this idea that Brexit was the most searched term. And we don't really see why reply is where they're bringing this up. And we don't see that this is proof that people are not really aware of the education and aware of the circumstances. This is not real tangible uh, evidence from that. Then they say that um, on proposition we told you, hold this whole idea about education, how people will be incentivized to gain an education because they feel empowered. The fact and idea that they think that they can change the circumstances, that they can change and have a say on what is going on in the government. This was completely ignored on this whole argument that I came in my speech was completely ignored, which came to the point in which I questioned my visibility and my existence because I don't think they really engaged with anything I said in my speech in second speaker. So then this idea of representation, opposition comes up here and says, you, oh, you don't show at all how people whose voices are heard will translate into political action, and this is a principal inconsistency. We told you around 15 times in this debate that as long as your voices are heard, that is perfectly fine for representation. They're saying that our problem in our argument, the reason we lose, is because it doesn't translate to political action. In their world, for minorities, it doesn't translate to political action as well. Their only argument is Congress existing, but with referendums, Congress exists as well. It is not an event vacuum. We're living in a world where they can act in parallel, so those benefits of Congress exist on our side, and those harms of referendum don't really happen. Then this idea of government only focusing on a few trivial issues, and they question this uh, idea, why can't we have more referendums? We clearly said that we'll have referendums for any significant issue and avoid anything trivial, but they keep time and time again questioning when we'll have it. On proposition, we told you the principles of democracy and how it is best through referendums, something they didn't really deal with, and this whole idea that came from me, how this checks and balances, how people's self-interest can be overturned, how people's uh, greediness can be overturned simply because people from the body, people, other people in the society are gonna care People have a say to change the, uh, go the government and the decisions, and thus they'll voice their opinions and check and balance the people who are making the authority and making the decisions for them. And because we care for the people and we truly think that what is best of democracy is gained on our side, we are proud to oppose, and thus you should vote for referendums. Thank you.